Hey everybody, I wanted to work on another video and I had the idea to talk about my favorite board games. Tabletop games are a pretty misunderstood animal by most. A lot of people can only name the old standbys, Monopoly, Sorry, Uno, but there's actually quite a huge industry of designer board games, most of which are considerably better than those mass market games. I'm always interested in ways to share new experiences with others and board gaming is just one of those areas that I've invested my time into exploring. Now I'm going to exercise discipline to keep this video a manageable length, but if you want to know more about any of the games I'm covering, just search for them. You'll be able to find plenty of reviews and walkthroughs out there. If you know me in real life and want to play any of these games, definitely hit me up. I think I've found some real gems, and without further ado, let me get into my top 20 favorite board and card games as of December 2020. Coming in at number 20 is my favorite deck building game, Ascension. I'm convinced there are better games in this genre, but coming from a Magic the Gathering background, I really like the fantasy theme of this one. You start the game with a handful of cards that can be used to fight monsters and buy more powerful cards that you'll be able to use as soon as your deck runs out. You're continually improving your deck of cards throughout the game and doing wilder and wilder things each turn. I like the tension of whether to specialize in fighting or purchasing, and I like the engine building you can do buying just the right cards that will combo together, replace themselves, and let you draw through your whole deck. Number 19 is Betrayal at House on the Hill. I mentioned experiences, and this is the best one to have on a spooky October night. You and your friends are exploring a haunted mansion, discovering new runes and creepy omens that will eventually trigger a haunt. What the haunt might be? You won't know until it happens. Maybe you'll encounter a legion of possessed dolls and will need to fight for your lives. Or maybe one of you will go berserk from an ancient curse and the rest of you will need to find an artifact to stop them. The rules can sometimes be a bit wonky in this game, but you'll get by. And if you've got the lights dimmed and your friends are intent on reading the mysterious lore of each new thing you uncover, you can't beat this one for a Halloween party. Gemblow is my number 18, and it's an abstract strategy game about placing vaguely Tetris-like colored pieces on a hexagonal board. You want to be the one to place the greatest number of pieces. It's light, easy to teach, and looks great on the table. And I like scanning the board for where I can worm my piece through somewhere my opponent thought they'd blocked me. There's not much else to say, so let's keep this video moving. Number 17 is Battlestar Galactica the board game. This is a theme-rich social deduction game, a phrase you'll hear an awful lot on this list as it's my favorite genre. You are playing as the crew of the Galactica, trying to find a new home for humanity and facing hurdle after hurdle. I loved this show, and I love how thematic this game is, as you're watching everyone's actions and aren't quite sure who you can trust. Someone might be a Cylon infiltrator who's actually sabotaging you. Do you accuse your friend and try to flush them out of an airlock, or do you watch them a bit longer and risk them really messing up your plans? This game is a bit on the lengthy side, but if you enjoy the show, I'd highly recommend it. Number 16 is Code Names. You will have a 5x5 five five grid of words and will split into two teams with one person on each team being the clue giver. They're trying to give short clues that will guide you to guess a designated set of words, but be careful. If you guess the other team's words, they will get those points. And worst of all, there's one word that if guessed is an instant loss for your team. The fun here is in getting into each other's heads. As the clue giver, you might have a clue that could connect three of your words, but oof, it might connect it to a fourth word that they absolutely cannot guess. Do you take the risk? Do you know how their mind works? Find out with code names. Coming in at number 15 is a well-respected Cold War simulation game for two players, and that is Twilight Struggle. One of you will be the United States and the other the Soviet Union, and you're trying to counter each other's attempts to expand your influence over the world. You can attempt coups and proxy wars, but don't get too aggressive with your strategy or you risk plunging the world into nuclear war. You have cards based on real historical events that you can play for that event, or to help spread your influence. I love that sometimes you need to use your opponent's card, but doing so will trigger that beneficial event for them, so you want to time it so it helps them as little as possible. The cards also tend to come out in an order that is historically accurate thanks to the deck being divided into three time periods. Twilight Struggle is just a richly thematic experience full of interesting decisions for both players. Number 14 is Spectre Ops. This is a hidden movement game where one player will be infiltrating an enemy compound, warehouse, whatever, and the other players are trying to hunt down and eliminate them before they can complete their objective and escape. What makes this interesting is the infiltrating player is not marked on the board, and is instead writing their movements secretly on a separate sheet. 
The hunters have to search, and if the hidden player ever lands in or crosses their line of sight, they must reveal that publicly, helping the hunters zero in on where they could be. It's so tense as the hidden player listening to your friends point right at the spot where you are and say, he could be here, and you just have to poker face it. Next up is Time Stories at 13. If someone asked me what the deep end of the kinds of experiences board games can give is, one of the games I would mention would certainly be Time Stories. You and your friends work together as time-traveling investigators, trying to solve a mystery and put a stitch in time. This is essentially a choose-your-own-adventure book with gorgeous art and lots of choices. Do you check that drawer? Talk to the nurse? Go to the observatory or the garden? Each choice takes some of your precious time and when you run out, you're jacked out of this time period like something from the Matrix. Thankfully you can go back in and start again, this time using the knowledge you just gained. You now know the nurse didn't have anything useful to tell you and you can beeline straight for that hidden passageway you found. There are many different modules or stories that you can play, and while I've heard that some of the later stories started to wane in quality, I think this is an incredible idea and I was absolutely blown away by time stories. My number 12 is another social deduction game, Spyfall. This is a quick game where each player will receive cards that show the same location a casino, or a beach, or a space station, or a hospital, etc. The twist is that one player receives a card with no information on it, just spy. Players begin asking each other questions one at a time and listening to the answer to determine if that player knows the location or not. If you think you've found the spy, you can stop everything and call for a vote to oust them. Or, if the spy thinks they've figured out the location, they can announce it and if they're correct, they win. The fun here is in trying to ask questions and give answers that are vague enough to throw the spy off, but will still convince the other players that you know the location. If I'm asked, what are you doing here, and I say, trying to win lots of money, the spy is going to guess we're in a casino, but I might say something like, you know, just rolling, and the spy might think we're on a train or something, well hopefully the others will know I'm talking about dice. Sometimes this can get pretty hilarious, especially when the spy gives an answer that's just ridiculously wrong. I highly recommend this for parties. My number 12, Spyfall. 11 is Pandemic Legacy Season 1. Pandemic has been a benchmark for cooperative board games since it came out in 2008, and this is the legacy version of that idea. You play as medics, epidemiologists, researchers, etc., working to stop viruses from spreading around the world. And while the theme might be a bit on the nose in 2020, what makes this cool is that it's a custom experience that changes as you play. You'll play anywhere from 12 to 24 games, depending how well you do, and each time the board will change. You'll open new components, rip up cards, and the story will develop. Maybe one of the viruses mutates and it's harder to treat, so you need to rethink your strategy. Stuff like this will constantly happen, and by the end you'll have a story that you and your friends will remember for a while to come. Alright, top 10 time. This is Crude the Oil Game. This is an economic game where you're trying to strike oil and you're converting oil to gasoline and buying and selling on the global market. Wait, wait, come back. What's really cool is the way in which you'll be rolling dice on your turn, which will trigger the abilities of structures you've built on a grid, but it will also possibly trigger stuff on your neighboring players' grids. You'll spend money to make money and buy low and sell high, but the whole time the economic forecast is changing. Do you plan for an expansion and hoard a bunch of oil, or do you hold out for a downturn that will make the price of equipment lower? It might be a bit dry for some, but I really enjoy trying to accumulate the most money to win in Crude the Oil Game. Have you played Pictionary? Well let me introduce you to its much more interesting cousin and my number 9, Concept. Concept is a game where one player is going to draw a card and choose something for the other players to try to guess. It could be a person, an object, an animal, a famous phrase, anything. Then they're going to be placing colored pawns and cubes out onto a really well thought out board of spaces that will help them to convey different ideas. The pawns indicate the concept, and the cubes are used to clarify, while different colors can be used to introduce sub-concepts that are related to the main one. So, if I'm trying to get people to guess Yoda, I might place the main concept pawn here to indicate that it's a man. Then I might place corresponding cubes here to indicate that he's green, or here to indicate that he's short, or here for fictional. If needed, I might use a second pawn to introduce the sub-concept of a movie. The movie is about conflict or wars. And maybe I'd tap another cube on this space to point out the stars. You can see what I'm getting at, and I can't talk while I'm doing this, so everyone else is trying to follow my logic. 
They don't know exactly what I'm thinking, and the end result is really fascinating, especially when you use the more difficult concepts like phrases and quotes. That's my number nine, concept. At number eight is a dexterity game, and this is my replacement for Jenga. It's called Junk Art. In Junk Art, you'll be stacking a bunch of oddly shaped and colored pieces on a small wooden base. Get points for using more pieces or having the tallest structure, and don't let anything fall or you'll be penalized. There's a bit more to it than that, but it's a simple idea and what really has me enamored with it is the care that went into including these specific pieces. They all seem to combine in interesting ways and the structures that you'll build can get pretty impressive. Think you have a steady hand? Try Junk Art. And now at 7 is the game I've played easily 10 times more than all of the others on this list combined and that's Magic the Gathering. For a decade I played in weekly tournaments and traveled around the country to play for big prizes in this collectible card game. Magic is pretty ubiquitous, but if you don't know what it is, it's a fantasy-themed collectible card game where you're essentially a wizard called a planeswalker. You'll be amassing and using mana to conjure spells and summon creatures and allies to help you defeat an opponent. I cherish the variety that I experienced in my heyday of playing this game. It's a great system, and you can build a million different decks with a million different playstyles and synergies. Maybe you will get aggressive with cheap creatures, or try to draw through your deck and kill an opponent in one big showy turn. Or maybe you're going for a slow crescendo of powerful magic to bend the game to your will. This one falters a bit for me just because after multiple thousands of games, I can't look at these cards and see anything but mechanics. The theme is gone. I just see numbers, resources, tempo. But I really will always love Magic the Gathering. Up next at 6 is a light party game called Dixit. You and your friends will have a hand of cards with absolutely stunning and quirky artwork, and on your turn you'll choose one to play face down, and you'll give a clue, which could be a word, a phrase, a sound, anything. Everyone else plays a card from their hand face down that they think best matches that clue. The cards are shuffled and revealed, and the other players guess which card was yours. They can get points by fooling others into picking their cards, but the hook is that you must get some of the players to guess your card, but not all. If either all or none of the players guess correctly, you get nothing and they can jump ahead. This is one of those games that I just find fascinating because you aren't playing the game, but playing the other people at your table. I might give a clue based on a movie reference that I know one player won't get, or based on an inside joke that I have with that one friend, and I think those moments are really spectacular. Not to mention the art, which is an absolute joy to thumb through. Dixit, my number six. Number five is The Resistance. In this social deduction game, you are part of a resistance movement that has been infiltrated by saboteurs, and a leader each round is going to be choosing players to send on a mission. Those players will play one of two cards that will determine if the mission succeeds or fails. Good players can only play success, but bad players can play either success or fail. A single fail card will tank the mission and cause an uproar as the table tries to determine which one of the people on that mission sabotaged it. As the tension increases, some teams may not get to go on their mission as everyone at the table gets to vote on whether or not to accept that team. It's a game about trust, deception, social cues, and for how quick this one plays, I don't think it has an equal. That's the resistance. Number four has really shot up my list in recent months as I've started playing this regularly over Zoom, and that's Ultimate Werewolf. Yet another social deduction game where all players have hidden roles and are trying to figure out who is good and who is an evil werewolf that's killing people at night. You'll discuss and vote on who to lynch during the day, and then players will close their eyes and might get woken up at night if they have an action to take. You might be a seer that gets to check one person to find out if they're a werewolf, or you might be a bodyguard that can protect one person, or one of any number of other roles. It can be a bit lengthy, and it's a game with player elimination, so you might get killed early and not get to do much, but I absolutely love watching as well as participating. The conversations are fantastic, trying to read people's faces and catch them in lies, and I love trying to pull off weird stunts and bluffs. Probably my favorite thing, and this may be cheating since it's not in the actual boxed game, but the endless variety of custom roles and interesting rules variants that the people in my group come up with always keep the games fresh. Many of the games that I'm in are recorded and posted to YouTube, and I'll post links to some of the channels that host these werewolf games so you can check them out if you're interested. Rounding out the top three is, wait for it, a social deduction game, <laughs> this time about solving a murder. The game is Deception Murder in Hong Kong. I do think this is the best social deduction game out there. 
You'll each get a hidden role at the beginning of the game, and one player will reveal that they are the forensic scientist and will be silently giving clues to the table. Everyone else will either be an investigator or the murderer. Players will have these cards that represent murder weapons and evidence left behind at the scene of the crime, and the murderer will secretly indicate to the forensic scientist which of their weapons and evidence is the real combination that will give them away. With that knowledge, the scientist is going to be placing bullets on these cards that could indicate the cause of death, the location, or other elements of the crime scene that are randomized, and then the table will be discussing. If they indicate it was a poisoning, you know it wasn't dynamite, for example. But the murderer is discussing too, and that's where the fun is. That player might be really convincing that no, in fact, one of the others has a syringe, and that could be how the victim was poisoned. You're always involved, you're always trying to solve this mystery, and the game is great from all players' perspectives, and that's why it's my third favorite. Number two is bittersweet, because I don't know when I'll ever get to play it again, since it's so tricky to teach someone, but I'd always be up for it, and this is Android Netrunner. This is an asymmetric, two-player living card game about hacking into a corporation and stealing their most scandalous and confidential information. And when I said I can't look at magic and see theme, this game is the opposite. It oozes theme, and I'm so over the moon with the cyberpunk hacking aesthetic. One player will be the corporation, trying to leverage their wealth and deploy the tools of the trade, potent ice firewalls to prevent the hacker, or runner in this universe, from stealing anything important. The runner is trying to use their speed and low to the ground resourcefulness to build a rig of programs that can crack the codes and bypass the security protocols the corporation set up. If it sounds interesting, it gets so much better because this game is really about bluffing. You see, the corporation has a hand of cards which they've drawn from their deck, which might discard into a discard pile, all three of which are considered servers which the runner can try to access. But the corporation can also play cards face down to establish another server which the runner can try to access. The runner has to decide where their best target is. That new server might be an agenda that if left untouched will advance and score the corporation the points they need to win, but it might also be a waste of time, or worse, a trap that if accessed will hurt the runner. Netrunner becomes this crazy game of cat and mouse where the runner has to choose their targets carefully and strike at the right time. I could talk forever about how enamored I am with this system, its theme, the amazing cards, the different factions and programs, and I probably shouldn't because I still have one game to go, and it's a big one. Last but certainly not least is the game that proved to me that there's something uniquely special about sitting around a table with friends that can't be replicated through a computer game. I'm talking about Twilight Imperium, specifically the fourth edition. This game puts you in the driver's seat of one of many galaxy-spanning alien empires and gives you a framework to experience that, fully, to your heart's content. You can conquer planets for their resources, you can build impressive fleets, you can trade, negotiate, explore, research technologies, and do pretty much anything you want to in this sprawling 8-hour experience with a capital E. This game more than any other will create lasting stories that you can tell with your friends. Galactic battling sounds pretty cool, but what I really, really, really keep coming back for is the table talk, the backstabbing deals, and diplomatic conundrums that you'll need to solve with your friends. This isn't risk. You don't haphazardly throw units at each other and try to plaster the board in your color. No, like real life, war is messy, and while you'll need to win some strategic battles, likely, prolonged fights are undesirable. If you get into an arms race with a hostile neighbor, neither of you are going to win because you want to remain as flexible as possible in order to score victory points. So instead, you talk, you negotiate, you offer ceasefires and alliances, open up trade agreements and promise to vote with them on the next meeting of the Galactic Council. Oh yes, I forgot to mention that you get to vote on laws that could change how the whole galaxy operates. Isn't that incredible? This game is just so much and each alien race that you can choose from is so unique and has its own powers and drawbacks that lead to games being so so much fun as everyone's invested in the empire that they've built. The mighty people of the Kakan will not be insulted by the trade offer you've just made, fool. <laughs> yes, this game is hard to get to the table. It's a game that you set aside an entire day to play, but there's simply nothing like it. It's like Civilization, the computer game, but so much better because you're discussing live and looking your friend in the face as you physically move that fleet of dreadnoughts into their home system. The other players at the table giggle and cheer, or whisper in that player's ear. 
What did they say? Are they plotting against you? Your good neighbor wouldn't do that after all the lucrative trading you've shared in, would they? You'll have to play this game to find out. Thanks again for checking this out. This was super fun to put together. Let me know if you have any questions, and happy gaming!